In 1946, a pharmaceutical company was founded in West Germany with the aim of producing highly demanded, affordable antibiotics for the markets. Although they failed to produce antibiotics, they have succeeded in purchasing a tranquilizer from another company, refining it, and creating a wonder drug that alleviated headaches, insomnia, nausea, colds, asthma, and high blood pressure. Moreover, Based on the results obtained from the lab rats, it could have been taken in large quantities without causing any overdoses. This was a major success, as the existing market alternatives at the time were addictive barbiturates, which could easily lead to fatal overdoses. In 1954, a patent application was filed stating that the drug had been successfully tested on humans. However, what actually was done was that the drug had simply been given to random people to try, and it received positive reviews. Formal testing only began in 1955, and to the delight of manufacturers, no side effects were detected. In 1957, the drug was released for sale in West Germany and became the second most popular drug after aspirin. Within a year, it has also flooded other countries around the world. What happened next? I'll tell you if you hit that like button and subscribe to the channel. And thank you very much for doing so. So, what happened next? Well, the drug was especially enthusiastically received by pregnant women as it alleviated all symptoms associated with carrying a child. This even became the basis for the drug's advertising campaign. In September 1960, the wonder drug arrived in the United States. However, Dr. Frances Kelsey, who was responsible for giving it an approval, refused to do so. She had only been in this important position for about a month and apparently was not yet worn down by the formality of the bureaucratic procedure and thus remained vigilant. She was not satisfied with the task that had been conducted on the drug. She was troubled by the fact that large doses of the substance had no detrimental effect on lab animals and, in fact, did not even have a calming effect on them, unlike in humans. Perhaps the issue was that it simply didn't metabolize by animals or something else. Moreover, the company was aware of the risk of developing a neuritis from the drug and still was silent about it, especially when many therapists had already started reporting this symptom in patients who had been already prescribed the wonder pill some time ago. Due to her stubbornness, she even began receiving threats. However, she continued to delay approval, constantly insisting on more new research. Also, the nuclear arms race between the Soviet Union and the United States was in full swing at this time. Naturally, Thanks to wide media coverage, everyone was aware of the harmful effects of radiation on organisms. And given the large number of nuclear tests being conducted by the superpowers, it didn't surprise many when there was an increase in the number of children born with various physical abnormalities, missing limbs, ears, and other such horrors. However, this seemed to be happening mostly in West Germany, when scientists finally began to seriously question why children with such severe defects were born to otherwise healthy mothers and started looking for the cause of this abnormality, it turned out that the mothers of all children born with deformities had taken that very wonder drug during their pregnancy. It was only in 1961 that the drug's impact on the fetus was studied. The research showed that the substance affects the DNA of the embryo and disrupts the cell development. If the drug is taken on the 20th day of pregnancy, the child's brain will be affected. If it is taken on the 21st day, the eyes will be affected. On the 22nd, the face and from the 24th to 28th days, the legs and arms are affected. In reality, this should not have come as a complete shock to science. It has already been known that drugs taken by the mother could affect the child in utero. However, at the time, it was relatively new information. During animal tests, it has not been taken into account that the active substance might not have an effect on rats at all. As it turned out, it had virtually no effect on the animal's body. To demonstrate that rats did come down after taking it, researchers had specifically conducted the experiment in such a way to obtain the desired result. Oh, and by the way, that wonder drug was called thalidomide. One of the first families to suffer its effects likely worked in the very company that produced thalidomide. Having access to the development, the employee secretly brought the drug home for his pregnant wife. On December 25, 1956, they had a child born without ears. At that time, nobody could have imagined it was connected to the new drug. 
By various estimates, between 1956 and 1961, the Lidomite adversely affected between 8,000 and 12,000 newborns, nearly half of whom died within the first year of life. Several more thousands were never born at all. And additionally, another 40,000 people or so were diagnosed with neuritis as a consequence of their thalidomide usage. Chemically speaking, the lidomide comes in a racemic mixture. In other words, the equal 50-50 mixture of two enantiomers. The research suggests that it is the R stereoisomer that has the desired sedative effect and the S stereoisomer is the one that causes the birth defects. So why wouldn't you just separate those, you might ask? Well, enantiomer resolution is a time-consuming and expensive endeavor. On top of that, the body seems to racemize it anyways. So even if you gave enantiomerically pure R stereoisomer of the drug to a patient, the body would still convert some of it into the S stereoisomer. This means that it's impossible to avoid the adverse effects of the drug no matter how much you try. However, despite the horrific teratogenic effect, the drug was still widely prescribed to patients. It took some serious media pressure to get the drug removed from the market. Interestingly, while there was a criminal investigation into Gronenthal Company, no one was seriously penalized. The company concealed known side effects like neuritis and consistently denied any link between epidemic of birth defects and their drug. And they still operated within the legal norms of the drug production and the sales of the time. So the company got away with paying compensation to the victims of the tragedy, and that's about it. Dr. Francis Kelly, who prevented the drug from entering the United States, States was honored by President Kennedy for her outstanding civil service. The tragedy itself, that is often referred to as the biggest man-made medical disaster ever, marked the beginning of the new era in drug licensing. Since then, drugs have been subjected to far more requirements and rules. And of course, studying the effects of drugs on unborn children has become mandatory for every drug. Thalidomide is now used again for diseases like leprosy, tuberculosis, HIV, and certain tumors. Naturally, this is only the case where pregnancy is not a factor. So the next time when somebody tells you that chemistry is boring and studying stereochemistry is a pointless waste of time, tell them this story. Do you want to hear more interesting stories about the history of chemistry and how it influenced the modern world? Tell me in the comments below. Thank you for watching and I'll see you next time.